excuse me. Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. I hope you're all well and flourishing. Today I'm coming at you with another more personal video, following up the video I made about anxiety a few months ago. In this video I will be talking to you about depression and my experience with living with it. A lot of you probably didn't know until recently, or maybe until I mentioned it briefly in the anxiety video, that I do suffer with depression and a lot of people would probably advise me against making this video because it's still a fairly taboo thing to talk about, um, especially in comparison to something like anxiety or other medical problems. But if there's something I've learned over the last year or so is that it's so much better to talk about things openly and start a conversation because the consequences of not doing so can be fatal. I'm sure you've all seen the statistics at some point of, um, you know, the amount of lives lost from depression, like, alone, and it's quite heartbreaking. Like in my anxiety video, I'm going to break it down for you scientifically and then give you my personal views and experiences as well. I'm also going to include timestamps in the description below in case you just want to watch certain parts of the video that are relevant to you, which is absolutely fine. I'm not expecting every single person to sit through what might be over a 20 minute video. That's like completely fine. So first I'm going to start by defining depression in a simple yet scientific based way and then elaborate with my own definition based on what it is to me personally. According to the mind.org website, Depression is a low mood that lasts for a long time and affects your everyday life. At its most severe, depression can be life-threatening because it can make you feel suicidal or simply give up the will to live. When does low mood become depression? We all have times when mood is low and when you're feeling sad or miserable about life. Usually these feelings pass in due course, but if the feelings are interfering with your life and don't go away after a couple of weeks, or if they come back over and over again for a few days at a time, it could be a sign that you're experiencing depression. So that's the technical definition covered. Now onto my own take on it. To me, depression can range from something seemingly mundane, like not being able to attend social events because I feel too low, to more serious and debilitating things, like not being able to get out of bed for an entire day, which I do experience fairly regularly. And obviously this in turn affects my entire day because if I can't get out of bed, it means I can't shower, then it means I can't go downstairs and speak to people, or I can't eat because I haven't brushed my teeth yet, so I'm not hungry, if that makes sense. Um, can't go to work, etc. All of which contribute to living a normal life. The thing is with depression is that it's not just a day here and a day there. Well, not for me, anyway. It's a feeling that's with me 24-7, no matter who I'm with, what I'm doing, regardless of how happy I might seem to other people. Luckily for me, I'm a good actor, so when I feel I need to, somehow I manage to act like I'm not a complete mess, even though a lot of the time, internally, I'm screaming. But anyway, when I was writing out my notes for this, I realised how much of a problem that last bit that I just said is, because the fact that depression is such a misunderstood and taboo thing that in certain situations I feel like I have to pretend to be okay, that's not okay. And I feel like that contributes to a huge amount of the issue surrounding people not understanding it. So that's why I'm here today to talk to you about this because I think it's so important to educate others. Um, I feel like depression is one of those things that you'll never be able to entirely understand unless you go through it yourself. So if I can help even one or two people to understand me or understand someone else a bit more who is suffering with depression, then I've done my job. Um, because sadly with things like mental health, it's sort of up to the people suffering to educate and enlighten so that more help can be made available and more awareness can be spread on the issue. Now I'm going to talk about my first experience with depression. So, as you already know, if you've watched my previous video, um, my anxiety issues initially came about in my last year of high school, and they've been there ever since, but I only started to experience depression just under a year and a half ago. 
Um, I'd been at uni for a couple of months. I was loving it. It was as good as I would hoped it would be. Um, but of all things to inherit from my family, I did not think depression would be one of them. Like, ever. Because if you know me, you know I'm like a very happy, bubbly sort of person. Um, and obviously I'm not blaming anyone for it. But one side of my family does have a history with depression. So I guess I shouldn't have been too surprised that one of us, um, one of the four of us being myself, my brother and my two cousins, uh, would experience it at some point. I went home one weekend, this is a few months into uni, and on the drive back to uni on the Sunday, I started to feel really weird. Like, this wave of sadness came over me, and I remember being completely silent for the whole drive back and not talking to my mum at all. I was really confused because I was like, there's nothing to feel sad about, I'm having a great time at uni, but it wasn't a normal feeling of sadness. It's quite hard to explain, but it was sort of like a numbness combined with sadness. And I spent the whole day thinking about why I felt like that. And when I reflected on it, I realised that it wasn't the first time I'd felt like that. It was just the first time I'd noticed feeling like that in the moment. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. So I'd felt it before multiple times in the couple of weeks before that day, but I'd never actually honed, on, honed in on how I was feeling, and I sort of just ignored it. As soon as I got back to uni that day, I went to my friend's flat and I spoke to her about it because I was just feeling very uneasy and confused, um, and she said to me that it sounded like I was experiencing symptoms of depression. So I went to the doctors as soon as I could, like literally a few days later, and I spoke about how I was feeling. And I filled out this questionnaire um, which assessed my mood and how it has affected my life since I started feeling like that. It's called a PHQ-9 patient health questionnaire and that is kind of the same one that any doctor or therapist will give all patients who experience depression or they feel like they might be experiencing depression and it just assesses your mood and gives you a score um, at the end of it. You're meant to redo it every couple of weeks. Um, to see how your mood fluctuates and to note whether it's improving or getting worse. I filled out this questionnaire and I got quite a high score which indicated that I was most likely experiencing depression. Um, at this point I was quite desperate for this horrible horrible feeling to be gone like ASAP um, so I didn't hesitate when the doctor asked if I wanted to try an antidepressant. So bear in mind I had never been on any kind of medication for my brain basically um, so this was a bit of a daunting experience but I was like I'm gonna go for it because I want to feel better as soon as possible so I can get on with my life and live as normally as possible. I started on citalopram which is a form of SSRI and SSRI stands for selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors and basically these work by enhancing the function of the nerve cells in your brain which regulate emotions um, and the SSRIs block the reabsorption of serotonin in your brain, making more serotonin available to you, if that makes sense. That's the, sort of the most simple way of explaining it that i found. So I was on Citalopram for a few months and it had absolutely zero effect on me. Um, if anything, it made me feel worse, which is common with antidepressants. And you will often hear doctors say, you'll feel worse before you'll feel better. It's just kind of a thing. I don't really know why. Um, but for me there was no period of feeling better, so I came off the pills and I tried a more natural alternative which was evening primrose oil capsules. These are often used by people going through menopause but I read up that they were good for depression so I was like there's no harm in trying them, um, they're natural you know. Um, and it's a bit foggy looking back on it but from what I remember I think they did help a little bit. But then we fast forward to April, um, which is a fair few months later. I left uni, as you all know by now, so this is April of last year, and I did start to feel a bit better depression-wise. My anxiety was still a huge problem, but the depression did ease up a little bit once I'd left uni. Um, and it remained that way for a couple of months, which was very nice. And then it was around June when the depression came back hard, just kicked me in the metaphorical balls and pushed me to the ground essentially. I have an idea of what may have caused it to hit me so hard out of nowhere but I'm still not entirely sure. So at the time I was on the pill 
and I was told by people that it's okay to not have a break between sheets of pills like once or twice um, so basically I did that in May because I just really couldn't be bothered to deal with my period that month so after going a month and a half without having a period I was like wow it's so nice not having to deal with that so I continued onto the third sheet again without the break in between the sheets of pills where you're meant to have your period so that made it two and a half ish months without having a period and as I said my depression started to creep back and get really bad to the point where it affected me being able to be in a relationship and resulted in me having no choice in to me but to end it and that was genuinely one of the hardest things I've ever had to do and I still think about it every day and still like wonder why life was like so unfair to me that it would um take away such a good thing from my life that was like really just um helping me in terms of like feeling better about myself and about life um so then in september of last year um i started on my second trial of antidepressants which was sertraline which is another ssri um I was on these for a few months and again I noticed no improvement whatsoever and at this point I was getting worse and I could genuinely like barely function. Oh sorry. I don't think it was until around this time that we realised that I needed proper help. Um, I think I spoke about this in my anxiety video so I'm just going to sum it up briefly for you. But I started on an online CBT program which would have reviews every couple of weeks on the phone with my supporter but long story short it wasn't working for me and then I started IAPT talking therapy which again didn't feel like enough for me so I went back to my doctor and I said that I really needed more like I needed something more intensive because all of this talking stuff was seeming very basic to me because I'm I'm a very vocal person when it comes to my problems and what I feel so, like, I talk to people about stuff all the time. I talk to my parents, my brother, my best friends. I'm not one of these people that just, like, doesn't talk about it. So all this talking therapy sort of stuff was, like, I was, like, right, this is basic. I need more. So I was referred to a mental health facility in my area. And from this point onwards, I had a number of appointments where I was assessed. And then it just became another waiting game. I literally had about... I had a few initial assessments with different people. And then I had about six weeks with um, a couple of therapists where they were literally just assessing me and finding out as much about me as they could. And that was like painful because every week I'd go in and at the end of the session they'd be like, OK, so when are we seeing you next week? And I was like, for fuck's sake, can I just start the fucking therapy already, please? Yeah, eventually after all these assessments, um, I started one-to-one -one CBT with one of those same therapists that was assessing me. Um, and I saw a psychiatrist who put me on another antidepressant in December, so this is my third antidepressant at that point. Um, this time it wasn't an SSRI, it was a tric tricyclic antidepressant. Um, these are an older kind of antidepressant, which are sort of more intense, they're, they're a second class drug, whereas um, SSRIs are a first class. And so they're more intense, but they do come with more side effects, which can be a problem. And the side effects of metazapine, which is what I was on from December until literally the other day, but the side effects are feeling sleepy and increased appetite and weight gain. Those are kind of the primary ones. And I didn't realise quite how bad side effects of medication can be until I started taking these pills. The side effects were so intense that they were actually making me more depressed so while it was good that they were making me pass out at night when I took them because I've had sleep problems for years they also left me ridiculously drowsy regardless of how much or how little sleep I was getting so every day I'd wake up and crave more sleep because I was so tired and groggy and also I was ravenous like if you ask Steph for the first especially for the first couple of weeks I was hungry all the time. I would not stop eating all night, like, before I went to bed. 
um, and I'd eat and not feel properly full and I would need more food like half an hour after a big dinner which is not like me at all and it got so bad that I basically spent all my time in bed because I was so tired and because I was so depressed that I put on so much weight and if you know me then you know that I've always been quite slim and had a good metabolism and I've always sort of been able to eat what I want not that I eat tons of crap but you know if I eat a pizza it's not gonna like bother my body kind of thing that all completely changed since being on metazapine um, I'm gonna insert a picture here of my weight log um, over the last few months and then you can see the extent of how much weight I was putting on in such a short amount of time and how much of it was actually sticking to me. At this point, I felt worse than I could have ever imagined a person could feel. Like, I did not know it was possible to feel this bad, just generally bad, all the fucking time. And I thought that what I was feeling at uni was bad, but it, honestly, that was nothing compared to how I've been for the last, like, let's say four or so months. I felt completely powerless and hopeless and on top of that, my body confidence was rapidly declining because I was retaining so much weight. And for the first time, basically ever, or at least since I started puberty, my body was changing. Because like, I've always been very, very skinny. And then I started puberty, started to get more curvy in places and whatever, which was fine. I was like, I love it, it's great. But for the first time, my body was actually changing in a way that I didn't like. And I was putting on like fat in places where I don't normally and it's just was very stressful. As well as the awful side effects that were making me feel even more shit, the antidepressants hadn't even begun to work to balance me out. So that's three failed attempts at antidepressants in less than a year. You can imagine it's quite exhausting, quite frustrating. Now I'm going to talk about the last few weeks uh, to a month and how that's been. I'm not going to sugarcoat anything because I think it's so important to be honest and upfront about how difficult and dangerous depression is. So I wrote my notes for this towards the end of March. Um, so I'll read you what I wrote back then and then I will update you on what's happened in recent days. So I wrote that we were coming to the end of March and if I'm honest I feel like I'm always either staying the same or getting worse. It kind of just depends on the day. I'll have days or maybe a week where I manage to not cry and sort of just get on with it. I don't really know how. These are the times where there's a glimmer of hope and I can sort of look towards the future. Although the depression is always still there in the background, like always. It's just slightly more subdued. But that doesn't mean that I don't feel it every minute of every day, no matter what I do. Um, and sometimes those times can be even worse because I'll finally find the energy to do something that I used to like but even that won't make me feel good which then makes me more upset because I feel like depression has stolen my identity entirely. Now going to recent, very recent updates, I went to see a senior psychiatrist um, last week and I spoke to her about everything. My mum had a massive go not at her but just at the system in general and how fucking hard it is to get some proper decent help um and for the first time in this whole time that i've been experiencing anxiety and depression for the first time someone said to me we are going to treat these two things separately and i was like why has it taken a year of well over a year of me being depressed and well five six years of me having anxiety, why has it taken that long for you to give me two different kinds of medication, one for each, because they're not the same thing. Yes, they might make you feel similar things sometimes, but they are very, very, very different disorders in and of themselves, and they do very, very different things to your body. Like, anxiety sort of speeds everything up, makes my heart be like this all the time, um, gives me knots in my stomach, makes me not want to eat, and then depression just makes me very slow, like I'm slow in everything I do, you know what I mean? They're just two very different things. So she prescribed me pregabalin, which is an anti-anxiety medication, and it's the first time I've ever tried anti-anxiety medications. Um, so I've been on these 
for about four days now. Um, so I'm hoping that these are going to do something for the at least the physical anxiety symptoms and also the mental side of it. But the physical side is just a fucking killer. Like to have your heart racing constantly is just really not fun. So she also said she wants to try me on another tricyclic antidepressant so the same kind of level as metazapine that I've just been taking but without the horrible side effects um, but in order to put me on those she wants me to have blood tests and an ECG first if you don't know an ECG is basically um, they hook you up to a machine um, and it basically takes a tracing of your um, heartbeat so like when you see people in hospital like and they have the little beep, beep, beep machine. It's kind of like that, and it has like a tracy thing where it like draws so you can see all like the peaks and troughs, and you can see when your heart rate increases and blah, blah, blah. So they'll normally um, have you hooked up to the machine for maybe like between maybe like 15 minutes and half an hour, so they can get like an accurate tracing of what your heart is like in general. So tomorrow I'm going for an ECG and some blood tests to make sure that I'm all okay um, to start the new antidepressants. So hopefully, fourth time round, hopefully those in combination with the anti-anxiety medication are going to fucking do something. Like I said before, there are the times where I might feel a little bit more stable and able to do things. But on the opposite side of the spectrum, there are nights like the 26th of March, as in, you know, a couple of weeks ago, whenever that was, where everything got too much and I broke down entirely and I can't even begin to explain to you how bad I felt, like there are no words. I was in bed and I got so overwhelmed by everything in my head and this endless sadness that was just clouding over me forever and always. I ended up messaging um, a number of my friends asking if they were awake because I really don't like disturbing people in my house when they're asleep. I'm like. I'd really just rather talk to someone that's already awake. Luckily one of my best friends was awake and she stayed awake with me for ages, like the absolute angel she is. Um, and I ended up pouring everything out to her, which included my very darkest thoughts and feelings. Um, I'm going to read out some of the messages I sent her and this is where it's going to get very real and deep. Um, like I said, I'm not going to sugarcoat anything because it's so important to talk about this so if you are triggered by anything related to suicidal thoughts and things like that then i would recommend skipping this part um also if you're a close friend or family member then i apologize if you get upset by this but as i said i'm just trying to shed light on the reality of it all so yeah so at this point I was sobbing hysterically for a very long time and experiencing all the thoughts and feelings that I regularly feel, like the bad ones, all at once. I, honestly, I wish I could say that that was me being dramatic, but in those moments I only say exactly what I feel. You're probably wondering how I managed to go on after all of this. And the simple answer to that is my friends and family. I'm lucky enough to have a family that is understanding and helpful and always there for me to fall back on. And I'm even luckier to have some of the most amazing people to exist as my best friends. My friends are genuinely my rock and I don't even think they realise like just how much they do for me just by existing. And I feel like these days good friends are so hard to come by and I've had my fair share of shit ones over the years but the people who are my best friends now I know are going to be my best friends for life and to be honest they save my life on a daily basis. They are the first people I turn to when things get hard because sometimes I find it easier to talk to friends rather than family and I like to give my family a bit of a break from listening to me go on about how awful I feel all the time even though they don't mind. But I do appreciate how hard it can be for them to see me like in such a bad way and in bed all the time and unable to function. And 
I live with them, so it's more of a constant thing for them to witness. So I'd sort of rather turn to my friends um, who have some time away from me, if that makes sense. I made an Instagram post recently where I tagged all of my friends that have gotten me through the last year or so, which has been the worst year of my life, genuinely, hands down. Um, I used to say that the worst year of my life was year 10, and now I'm like, year 10 was a piss pot compared to this. And I will never ever be able to thank my friends enough, because without them I really don't know like where I would be. I honestly do not. Sounds really bad, but it's true. Like, I may not be alive if it wasn't for them. Um, and yes, of course, my family are amazing and supportive, but without my friends who have stuck by me through everything, not just because they sort of have to, like family, not that I'm saying my family are only there because they have to be, but you know what I mean, like friends are there by choice. And without my friends reassuring me, I, I think I would feel like such a burden to my family because I know that they can feel helpless when they don't know what to do or how to help me or when their suggestions don't work. Try to explain to certain family members that as much as I can appreciate their help, they're not trained professionals and everyone is different so what works for them might not work for me and I don't expect them to know what to say or do to help me but all I need is for them to be there to sort of catch me. Now that I've covered all the deep stuff I'm going to finish up with some do's and don'ts for people who have loved ones that are suffering with depression and some of these will cross over with the ones from my anxiety video so just bear with. So do check on the person regularly and keep reminding them that you're there for them. People with depression often need extra reassurance and validation. But there, but there does need to be a happy medium between checking on them too much and sort of overwhelming them with, are you okay, are you okay, what can I do? And not checking on them enough. Um, so there needs to be a happy medium. So, you know, like, if they are in bed till quite late, sort of go in and suggest something that they can do or say, why don't we do this? Or, you know, just suggest something to sort of get them out of bed. But then also don't talk to them about their mental health all the time because sometimes the more we dwell on it, the more upsetting it can get. Do try and keep them active and get them out of the house. Even if it's inviting them around for tea or a movie, it's better than being alone. I would much rather heave myself out of bed, get on a bus, even though I hate going out in this weather and hate public transport, but I would rather do that and be with a friend or have a friend come round and literally just have a cup of tea, have a chat, watch a film, anything, than be by myself when I feel bad. <coughs> Excuse me. Do praise them and tell them that you're proud of them, even when they do the smallest of things. I often have days where I will do literally nothing and feel really bad about it. So having someone say, you know, well done for getting out of bed can honestly make all the difference to how I feel about myself and my progress. And whether it's getting out of bed, showering, leaving the house or whatever, little comments of praise um, can often give people the boost they need. So like the other day, I tweeted something like, oh, this is everything I've done today and it's 6 p.m. So here's me like, I've literally done fuck all today and it's 6 p.m. I have literally done nothing. But then I had a Twitter friend reply to my tweet and say, oh my God, well done, that's so good. These are the things I did today. I'm so proud of us. And that really did make so much of a difference because I was like, okay, I might have not done as much as I wanted to do, as much as I intended to do that day, but I have done something. I have gotten out of bed. It, I might not have gotten out of bed till fucking 4pm, but I got out of bed because I have literally had days where I have stayed in bed for the entire day. Like, I had a day at uni one day where I was literally in bed till 7pm. Like, hadn't got up to go to the toilet, hadn't got up to brush my teeth, hadn't got up to eat. So the fact that I just got out of bed is good enough. And it was just really nice to have her congratulate me for that and give me some praise and also it was really nice hearing what she had done that day um because she also suffers with depression so it's a nice way for us to sort of 
connect and be like, you're doing good, you're doing good, like, we're doing good. This one is kind of a do and a don't. So, do ask them about how their treatment is going now and again, but don't ask them all the time. Especially if they've said that they're not impro improving and that their treatment isn't working. Because sometimes I get really upset when people ask me how therapy is going and if my medication is working because I feel like the tone of their voice is always sort of hopeful and like indicative of them expecting me to say, oh yeah, it's going really well, I'm getting the help I need, I'm feeling so much better. And when in reality I'm not and the current treatment I'm receiving or have been receiving up to now hasn't been working. So it's a bit upsetting to talk about and be like, oh yeah, thanks for reminding me that nothing's going well. Just tread carefully, and if they seem uncomfortable when you ask, then change the subject. And I'm sure if things are going well and improving, then they will tell you themselves in time. So now we're going to move on to the don'ts. Don't assume that just because they haven't cried in a while or broken down in front of you, that they're getting better. As I said earlier, I've stopped letting myself cry in front of people for the most part because I just cannot be bothered to deal with all the questions or people feeling irritated if they can't cheer me up. Um, and the likelihood is that a lot of other people will wait until they're alone to let it out, like I do. Following on from that one, um, don't feel irritated if you cannot cheer someone up. It's, this especially goes for relationships, I would say, because a problem in my relationship was that my partner was sometimes irritated, not with me, not with themselves, just with the situation, at the fact that we'd be doing something, or I, I mean I got the same because they were suffering with the same issues as me, um, and we would both sometimes get sort of irritated that, you know, you're in my presence, or like, we're together, why do you still feel bad, like, why is this not helping, why is this not doing anything? So just be patient because, you know, they might not be feeling great, but you just being there is probably a little bit helpful, even if it's not making them feel better. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> this one is particularly for parents. Don't get annoyed if, um, let's say, your child has depression and if they stay in bed all day sometimes. For people like myself, my bed is the only place where I feel some sort of comfort and it's sort of my safe place and sometimes my only source of comfort when I'm feeling awful. So if they need a day in bed to recuperate, let them have it. Don't be on their case about it. Just let them do what they need to do because uh, they know what's best for them. Don't be surprised if they seem to be having an okay day or doing okay for a period of time, but then they relapse back into depression. Um, it happens to me regularly until the last sort of month or so where it's just been constant depression all the fucking time. It happened to me where like I'd have a week of being like sort of okay and then I'd go tumbling back down again. Yeah, I, I feel like that happens with most cases of depression as well. Like you kind of ebb and flow as they say. Um, and like even if I'm having a good day and I'm out doing something fun, it can just hit me out of nowhere. I'll just be doing something and then all of a sudden it's like a light switch goes on in my brain and I'm like, well now I feel like shit. So I think that just about wraps up this video. I really hope that it was informative and gave you a better insight into what it's like living with depression. And I hope that I can help even one person with this video, whether it's a person who is suffering with depression themselves or a friend or family member of someone who is. All I want to do is educate and spread hope and make you feel like you're not alone whether you're the person suffering or the friend or family member. I think I need to go ahead and have a good cry now. Anyway, thank you so so much for watching. Please feel free to message me your thoughts about this video and if you found it helpful or leave something in the comments below. Please give it a thumbs up if you found it helpful in some way and feel free to share it with other people. Um, I know that one of my best friends that watched my anxiety video 
she um, showed parts of it to her boyfriend so that he could help understand her anxiety better. And I thought that was so lovely because I was like, I've actually helped one person at least. And I actually had a lot, quite a few people um, message me after my last video. Um, I've still got all the messages saved on my phone. And yeah, I had quite a few people message me being like, you're so brave, I'm so proud of you for talking about this. I'm so glad you've talked about this because I'm dealing with the same thing too. And I just had quite a few messages like that and it was really, really nice to read. So please do tell me if this video has helped you in some way. Please share it with your family and friends if you, um, if there's someone in your sort of circle of people that's suffering with depression. And yeah, I will be back soon with another video. Just take care of yourselves and I will see you soon. Bye.